Fora TV. The world is thinking. Occasionally, sports and news come together in a rather dramatic fashion, and your father sat right in the middle of all of that at, at Munich. Yes. Can you share with us some of his thoughts about that experience? Um, I can because I was there um, in the studio with him. Um, many of you may know my dad was not the anchor of the Olympics in those days. He was doing gymnastics and track and field. And there was one day during the 15 days of the Olympics where there was no track and field and no gymnastics. And my dad was taking the day off. He was going to drive me and my family up to the uh, Bavarian Alps. So in the morning, when he goes downstairs, says to my, uh, his wife, I'm going to take a swim, I'm going to take a sauna. He's in the sauna in his wet bathing suits. He gets a call from Rune Arledge and says, Jim, I don't know what's going on, but something's happening over at the Olympic Village. You ought to get into the studio. So my dad runs upstairs, get dre- gets dressed, and then, of course, what develops is the first ever, you have to put this in perspective, the first ever... Um, nationally covered terrorist attack. I mean, no, the word terrorist was not in the American public lexicon. There were no suicide bombers. There were no, listen, there were occasionally, there were uh, things that happened. There was no regular terrorism in, in the world today. And all of a sudden, he is anchoring for 16 hours in the studio the only live coverage of the first major terrorist attack in the history of this, of this, this country. And for 16 hours he tells the story and it looks like the, all the athletes have been released and he, he doesn't go with that news because it's not substantiated. And he later said to Rune Arledge, why'd you pick me? I wasn't the anchor of the Olympics, Chris Schenko was. Why'd you pick me to be in the anchor chair for 16 hours? And Rune said, well, you first and foremost, you're a reporter and you were a newspaper reporter when you started your career. I knew that you could cover this news slash sports event. So he did a great job. Uh, sidebar story, which I, you may, may, many of you may have known. When it turns out that um, it looks like all the Israeli athletes have been killed um, at the airport outside Munich, he, my dad knew that, that there was a family in Shaker Heights, Ohio, named the Berger family, whose son was an, a weightlifter on the Israeli weightlifting team. And my dad knew that the only way, that they, he knew that they were watching him on television because he got in the telegram, he knew that this family in Shaker Heights, Ohio was gonna learn if their son was dead or alive. That was the way they were gonna find out through my father. So when he said they're all gone, and he made that you know, incredibly emotional and, and um, quintessential statement, he knew that he wasn't telling just millions of people in America the fate of the Israeli athletes, he was telling a family in Shaker Heights, Ohio, that their son had been killed. So to have the kind of presence and the state of mind to be able to cover that story as an objective journalist and also know that it was a story that had all sorts of emotional uh, ramifications is a remarkable uh, tribute to his job as a anchor and a reporter. It's why he won not just a sports Emmy that year, but he won the Emmy for the most outstanding newscast of the entire year against you know, Dan Rather and Tom Brokaw. And he, that was the single best newscast as voted by the Emmy Committee of the year. So it, it, it was an example of, of news intruding and being part of sports. Now it happens all the time. The uh, Iraq war happened to be launched at, literally at the same hour the NCAA basketball tournament kicked off on that Thursday six or seven years ago. So we had to intertwine our coverage of the war, which obviously was more important than a basketball game, intertwine that coverage with covering basketball. It's gonna to happen to in China this year. I mean, there's an enormous amount of news swirling around China, not just the, you know, the horrible um, um, earthquake that, that killed hundreds of thousands of people, not just that, but the, you know, the Tibetan issue and the Tibetan monks and the you know, crackdown in Myanmar and um, the protests and Tiananmen Square. You, you can't broadcast live from Tiananmen Square. I mean, China is the spot in, America, in the world right now that all these issues are coming together and NBC's going in there with their cameras to cover an Olympic Games. Well, they'll spend not as much time, but they'll spend an enormous amount of time figuring out the right mix of covering the protests and covering what is going on in China with their coverage of gymnastics and swimming and diving. I, I don't envy my friend Dick Ebersaw. He's a good friend of mine. He is the executive producer. He's going to be dealing with his news division almost as much as he is his sports division. So it's going to be difficult. They'll, they'll listen. They'll figure it out and they'll do a good job. But you know, what do you do if, uh, if, um, if there's a huge, if a, if, a, if a bomb goes off or there's a huge protest while the women's final is going on in gymnastics? That's a tough, now you, probably you put your gymnastics coverage on cable television and the network will cover the crises, but that has tens of millions of dollars of impact on the NBC television network because they've sold network commercials, each of which is probably being sold for over a million dollars for every single 30 second commercial. So all of a sudden, um, my counterpart at, uh, at NBC Sports says, oh wait a second, I gotta put on Brian Williams for the next half hour. This is, this is a major story. 
Every 30 second commercial that, 30 second commercial that does not run costs General Electric, who owns NBC, a million dollars. You may say, well, that's okay, you gotta cover this story. Yes, they'll cover that story, but if they lose 15 30 second commercials, that's $15 million just went out the door for General Electric. So you talk about sports being not just fun and games, being a billion dollar industry and then interspersing it and then putting it on top of a news event, it is very complicated. Um, you know, the Super Bowl, with the, Roger will talk about this, the amount of security around the, around the Super Bowl and trying to avoid something really bad happening on the highest profile event that happens every single year. But one day, I hate to say it, one day something will happen. Hopefully it won't be a big thing, but we'll have to, if we're covering the Super Bowl, we'll have to cover that story also. So it's um, just like, uh, Terrorism and politics has invaded all of our lives. When we go to the airport, you know, we spend an hour going through security. When we go to a sporting event, we got to go through the metal detectors. When, you know, our, our kids are, are um, going to, to Israel to visit our relatives, you worry about a bomb. I mean, just like all that has invaded our lives, it's, invoided, it's invaded the business of sports television also, and it's serious, and it needs to be covered in the right way, and someone has to have the sensitivity to decide how much of the sports you cover and how much of the news. So it's, it's, boy, I long for those days when my dad could go and do a gymnastics event and just worry about who was gonna win and lose and not all the other stuff going around. So it's a complicated world we live in.